Support for the series on women in science and tech comes from Genentech, dedicated to breakthrough science and social good that supports local communities. Because making medicine is just one way to make a difference. Genentech, the future of science is here. Online at gene.com slash future. Hello, I'm Kamla. My guest today is Shivani Goel. She is Vice President of AI and Cognitive Products at SAP Ariba here in Silicon Valley. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Kamla. Delighted to be here. Well, it's a delight to have you. What do you do? You are a Vice President of AI, which is Artificial Intelligence and Cognitive Products. So what exactly do you do at SAP Ariba? Yeah, so my role involves looking at the entire space of AI, machine learning, those technologies, cognitive technologies, and thinking about how can we bring those into our product line and our product portfolio so that we can drive more value to our customers and make their experience as well as their way of working more efficient. So yours is an enterprise product. So when we think of AI and machine learning, we think of Tesla, we think of healthcare. Why do we not think about enterprise software? and uh, talk about cognitive products. Why is that? You know, that's an interesting question. I will say I definitely think of it in terms of enterprise software. Um, I think AI is very relevant wherever you, wherever you have large amounts of data. And within enterprise software, we're constantly collecting a lot of data. The business that I'm part of, which is procurement, we enable B2B transactions uh, for buying and selling. And so we're collecting vast num amounts of data and being able to unlock the insights from that data and help people do their business better or help people work better is very, very natural to us. Mm. So what is AI in your world? Because there are, there's AI and there's AI. Yeah, so the way I think of AI is very, very broad. I think of it as spanning, or maybe even, you know, like, you know, there's a lot of interchange between AI, cognitive, what do these terms really mean? It's really around enabling computers to become more intelligent to allow them to start thinking and learning like humans, and then combining that with the power of being able to process large amounts of data. And so for me, that space covers many, many different technologies, including machine learning, deep learning, things like speech to text, text to speech, visual recognition, everything that comes together to help the computers help people do their jobs better. So this is supervised AI. Mostly, but it's also unsupervised. It could be you know, deep learning that allows you to start identifying trends and patterns without necessarily being programmed for the job. Okay, so the world has changed. The software world has changed. What about bots and chatbots? Do you use that? We use that, yes, yes. So and how do you describe a chatbot? Because in today's world, you know, when you talk of bots, I think of Twitter. Yeah, you yeah. Know, the bots that go and uh, uh, interact uh, with folks on Twitter, but how do how do you describe a bot or a chat bot? Yeah, I think it's more, I would broaden that to the term conversational interfaces. So being uh, enabling people to allow interaction with systems using conversations and then having this these bots or robots at the back end being able to deliver that information or that content or that action for the end user. So it's really, and I think this is, you know, chat bots, for example, you know, you see the term chat in it. It's about being able to, not just having to go into a screen and point and click to do the task, but maybe having a conversation and, you know, telling your intent and being able to get that information back for you. Um, you know, I think all of us are very familiar with Alexa and Siri in our everyday lives, right? Imagine taking that to your business applications and being able to interact with them in a straightforward and easy manner. So it's your an ambient, always-on world. It's your all in an always-on world, yes. And I think all of us have gotten used to that considering we have our phones with us yes. all the time, right? Yes, yes. And so we are not even aware that these phones can track. Yes. And, and, and people can hack into our phones and do things. Um, Two things that was very interesting about your profile is you say that you focus on strategy and driving revenue. Um, what do you do every day to make these two things happen uh, for your products? Yeah, great question, Kamla. And so, you know, from a background and training perspective, I've got an engineering and technology background, but I've also done a lot of work on business and strategy side. And what I find is that, you know, very often, 
especially as technology people, we fall in love with the technology and we think the technology is great just because it can do so many cool things. But we forget about the business value and you know what, in the end, every technology is as useful as the value it delivers to you as an end user. Um, so when I talk about business and strategy combined with technology, it's really about making sure that as we think about technology and technology progress, how are we using that to deliver value to the end customer? And then in turn, what is the business implication of it? Does it help somebody do their job better? Does it drive top line revenues? Does it drive savings? You know, being able to bring those pieces together is really what ends up helping a business survive and thrive. So do you have P&L or profit and loss responsibilities in your role? In my current role, I don't have P&L responsibility. Um, but yes, in some roles in the past, I have had to manage P&L as well. Did that make you anxious uh, handling P&L? I think it gives you a very different perspective. It allows you to think bigger picture when you have a P&L responsibility um, versus if you're in one area and you're only thinking about that one area, then that's the most important piece. But if you're handling a P&L, you're actually going across all aspects of the business and you know, making priorities and actions based on all the different dimensions, not just one part. Sometimes there is a lag in technology, mm -hmm. the way we adopt it, mm -hmm. adapt it. Mm -hmm. Companies may think differently, but the public may think differently. The go-to market strategy yes. may not stick. Yes. And today, you're in a whole different world. When you graduated, software was a whole different uh, uh, animal. Today, it's a whole different landscape that's changing so fast with chatbots, AI, machine learning, and everything. My question is, how do you look at new technology and how do you evaluate them and how do you come up with lens, with a lens that helps you say, okay, this technology is going to stick and if something doesn't stick, then how do you pivot? Yeah, so you know, I, I think you're spot on that there's so much change happening. Technology around us is changing and in, like, Every, you know, before it was decades or years the way we would see the change happening, now it's in days and months that we see that change happening. So the key, what we like to do is, you know, there's, there's a pace of change in, at which you can even adopt some of the new technology innovations that are coming out. Um, I think, again, I, what I go back to is where is the value in what we're delivering? So if you measure start Measure it thinking, in revenue? Do you measure it in revenue? How do you measure that value? Not necessarily in terms of revenue. I think it's more in terms of customer value and benefit from a, you know, it it could be in the form of increased efficiency. It could be in the form of making things more uh, accurate. Um, it could be in the form of driving retention or creating excitement. So there's many different vectors that we use to measure it. Uh, and revenue could be one of them. But in early stages of technologies, usually it's revenue is not the driver. It's how can you transform the business process or make things better. And then- So you're looking for traction. You're looking for traction, you're looking for that value, you're looking for what is it that I'm doing differently from what I'm doing before, and is it an improvement or is it not? You know, there's a lot of technologies out there that you could go forward with, but may not necessarily drive improvement and may take a lot of work to get set up, right? So it's really around what, to me it comes back to what is that value and then what is that effort to get there? And being able to analyze technologies across those two dimensions, one is the va customer value, the other is the feasibility. And feasibility could include technology readiness, it could inc uh, include readiness of the organization to adopt it, but those are the two vectors that I use to really understand what technologies are ready and how do you start moving forward with them. Now you grew up in India. You grew up in Bombay and you mentioned before I interviewed that uh, you weren't uh, particularly ambitious when you were a child mm -hmm. and when you were growing up. And yet you went on to do engineering at the Indian Institute of Technology and a master's at Princeton and you're a VP. How surprised are you by your own uh, path and trajectory? Yeah, I, I, yes, I do admit that when I was younger, you know, I was not very ambitious. Um, I was a yeah, I enjoyed my childhood immensely. I had a very uh, fun time and, you know, things fell in place. And you're the almost. youngest. And I'm the youngest of three kids. So, you know, I, I think the baby of the family is always the baby. Um, but, you know, I had really good role models. I had people around me. I grew up, my father's a scientist. We grew up in the scientific community. My mom is very, very artistic, so she helped bring together for me both the, you know, my father on the science side and my mom on the artistic side, bringing those two dimensions together. I had great role models. My sister was an inspiration. She went into engineering. She convinced me that I should follow that path as well. 
And so, you know, I kind of landed through that path. Um, and I would say my four years at IIT were fabulous. I really enjoyed that time. I think it was really towards my final year when I really started focusing and started thinking through what I wanted to do, which then led me in the direction of where I went for graduate school. And from there on, I feel like I've been much more focused in terms of what I'm trying to get to. And, you know, being able to, it, it's less about the, um, the growth or rise in a corporate ladder. It's more about the ambition of wanting to do something and have an impact in the world. So you also have a very interesting case because when some people, when they become VP or whatever, they have a five-year plan, a 10-year plan, and they say, even as a kid, I knew what I wanted to become. But you admitted you enjoyed your childhood. So and you got the clarity because of your sister who now works at YouTube and Google. And, uh, and in your fourth year, you got that clarity. Were you good at math and science? Were you good in your studies? Yeah, I was always good in my studies. So academically, I excelled. Um, you know, I think that helps because you get a lot of encouragement, you get a lot of support. Um, I also think that, you know, one of the things that I, and you know, while I say I was not ambitious, I kind of had visions of what I wanted to do. So I was telling you earlier that I used to watch this cartoon called The Jetsons, uh, which is this show if for those of people who haven't watched it, it's really about the future um, and, you know, um, flying cars and robot maids and things like that. It, just, it just caught my fascination and I've always been very, very interested in science fiction. We had the Star Wars movies and so on. So, you know, as I, I started developing that love for technology, um, even as I was growing up, not from an ambition perspective, but just from a fascination and something that I really enjoyed. And so my path kind of has evolved towards that. Mm. Um, and in fact, you know, I look at what I do right now and I feel like we're very close to the Jetsons age, right? We have our automated robot uh, vacuum cleaners around. We have our cars that are being self-driving and very soon we're going to have people already working on flying cars. Yeah, and we have like that. So yeah, it's it's a very interesting world. Uh, you said uh, uh, you read a lot of sci-fi. Who introduced you to sci-fi books or fiction? Well, I grew up in a very um, in a community that was very science oriented. Um, so you know, people would talk a lot about science and uh, science fiction. Have you passed it on to your children? My children, and I think most kids today, you know, they're just. I think for them, science fiction and technology is just part of their lives. Like, I don't even think they even differentiate between that. And so my kids are really, really into the latest technologies. They will watch all the new movies that come out. Um, and in fact, given the space I'm in where I'm looking at advanced technologies and innovations, very often my kids are my source of inspiration to learn more about what are the latest and greatest applications out there. Give me an example. So, you know, a few years ago, I was part of the mobile team at SAP and I was leading our mobile innovation program, which we were really look, working with customers to build applications on mobile devices for their businesses. And, you know, I would work with a lot of retail companies. I would work with a lot of consumer companies. And so my daughter would actually have applications on her device that she was using and she would be showing me, you know, whether it was shopping, whether it was fashion, whether it was communication, that I could then take back to my customers and help them see that, you know, these are some of the things that are going on. And so, you know, it really helped me in my work because I came across as being the cool person who knew all the latest <laughs> applications out there. <laughs> do your kids still uh, share uh, the latest and greatest apps with you? They do, yes, they do. They do. My older one is off in college now, so I get a little bit less from her, but you know, she, she's the one who used to keep me completely up to date. My younger one is now getting to that age, so she's starting to play that role. Are they pursuing a, a path like yours in engineering, or are they doing something else, your kids? So my older one is actually doing something very similar. She's doing both business and technology. So she's uh, combining the engineering side with the business side. My younger one is still in high school, so she hasn't quite decided whether she's going to go down an engineering path or a medical path, she's still. Well, I want to ask you about the role of your father and husband in shaping what you have become today. Yeah, so my father, of course, you know, from the very beginning, he's been my role model and mentor. Um, my father's a scientist himself, very much into science and technology. Um, and he's taught me, you know, the importance of being really good at your work. He's probably one of the best scientists in the nation. Um, in India? In India, yes. And so, you know, just always looked up to him for all that he brings to the table. 
And my husband is just an amazing, amazing person. I was very fortunate to meet him. Uh, we met in undergrad and we've been together for many years now. And he's my constant rock, my constant source of inspiration. He teaches me how to not take myself too seriously. How? <laughs> how? <laughs> to laugh more. Um, <laughs> but also be able to assert myself in situations where I'm not comfortable. And you know he's always encouraging me to do more and more. And in any relationship, I think we have you know where all of us are balancing so much. We're balancing work. We're balancing family. We're balancing um, relationships, being sisters, mothers, wives. Um, and he's always helped me be able to do whatever I want and achieve what I wanted. Um, and seamlessly, whenever we have transitions or um, areas where one person needs to set up, set step up, he's always there to catch me if I'm missing out or doing anything wrong or you know if I need him to take up and do more things he's always there. Is he also an engineer? He's also an engineer. Yes. What kind of an engineer? He's also a chemical engineer so we met in undergrad at IIT. Wow and what does he do today? He's at Applied Materials. Okay so you're lucky to have found somebody who uh, gives you air cover. You Absolutely know? or being actually he's my constant rock. Yes. A source of inspiration. Yeah so it's, and, and your father is also a source of inspiration for yes, you. Yes, yes. You've uh, mentioned that your father and sister uh, kind of helped shape your thinking when you were in college. Who else were your mentors that helped you? Because a lot of the time, mentors play a key role. Yeah. Uh, who are some of your mentors and how did they help you? Yeah, um, and you're right. I think mentors play a very, very key role in helping shaping and developing who you are. You know, when I was in school, we had a we had a couple of young professors that just came back from the U.S. Um, to teach in India, and you know that was the time when a lot of people were more migrating towards the U.S. and not necessarily coming back to India. Now, of course, there's a lot of people who are going back to India, um, but these young professors, the very dynamic. You know, one of them, Professor Kucker, is the dean at IIT. Another one, uh, Dr. Shinoy, was somebody you know who had a very strong influence on us. And you know, just the, the skills they brought, the thought process they brought, really energizing us and challenging us to think beyond our regular ways and you know, going outside the boundaries of what the textbooks had. I think they were very inspirational in terms of opening my mind to new things. And then when I started working, um, you know, I worked in consulting and there was a uh, lady um, Barbara Duganier, who was you know very young, very dynamic, and you know at a very senior position, and she showed me that you can never you know you sh you should never limit yourself in terms of what you think or what you can do. What do you mean by that? Never limit yourself. So you know, for example, um, I was very very I really wanted to come to do something to help India and help the environment in India and so you know I was working in consulting and at one point I said look I'm gonna take time off I'm actually gonna quit because I want to go back to India and do something to help the environmental situation in India and so you know she we just were talking one day over coffee and I was telling her this is what I'm planning to do and she was like well you know don't do that I'll help you out on this and instead of letting me quit she actually talked to the people in India from my consulting off group and she arranged for me to work with the ministry in India to help them on their environmental policies. So, you know, in some ways she helped me see how it's possible to make your dreams come true if you know what you're trying to do uh, without, you know, with different options available to you. Mm. And so, doing it through them, you know, through um, Anderson, which was the consulting company I was with, I was able to make a much bigger impact than what I would have if I just quit and tried to do something on my own. Why were you drawn to environment? I was very passionate, I am still very passionate about the role that um, individuals and companies play on their surroundings around them. Um, and there's three areas that I'm very passionate about. One is environment, the other is education, and the third is around entrepreneurship and uh, facilitating that. So, you know, environment was one of the places that being a chemical engineer, having done all this work with electric utilities, I felt that I could impact and influence some of the things that were happening with regard to environmental emissions across the country. Hmm. And well, how do you help facilitate entrepreneurship? Do you work with young people? Yes, yes. So um, we actually do a number of entrepreneurial events, activities, hackathons. I was on the board of this nonprofit called Build, uh, which was basically looking at how to help people in um, um, 
challenged neighborhoods where there was a lot of dropout in high schools. How do you encourage the kids to stay through high school and go on to college? So this was here? Here, yes. In San Jose? Um, in the Bay Area, yes. So okay. it's a company called Build. Mm. It's a nonprofit called Build. We actually have branches in the Bay Area, in D.C., and in other parts of the country as well. But the focus was enabling youth to understand, you know, to get excited and motivated, learn about entrepreneurship, and use that as an incentive for them to stay on through um, high school and go on to college. Mm. Um, what advice would you give to somebody who wants to enter the um, world of technology and engineering? You know, it's a whole different landscape like we discussed earlier on. What skills do you think they need to have today? Yeah. When you graduate, it was very different. You needed to know coding, but today I think you need to do a data maybe. You need to know a lot more. Yeah, I think you need to know a lot of um, like data, data analysis. I think the bigger thing, it, well, I, so I think you need your core foundation for which sure, is? which is on engineering and technology. You need to know how technology works, how applications work. You need to know data and how to handle data. Um, but I think there's more to that now. I don't think it's just purely the technology side. I think you need to know what are the business problems, the problems you're trying to solve knowing the right questions to ask, you know? So to me, it's actually broader than, you know, just knowing the technology. It's about also knowing what are the questions you need to ask to be able to understand what are the insights you need and what are the then being able to apply the technologies, right? I think that's a very key skill. I think another piece that's really important. How do you learn how to ask the right question? Because that is such a pat answer in some ways. You know, you need to know, but how do I know what is the right question? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's experimentation. I think it's practice. I think it's just being not afraid to ask the questions. Were right? you always not afraid? Um, Were you ever afraid? Uh, no, yeah, I would say growing up, you know, there were times when you would feel, okay, is this a dumb question? Do I ask this? What will people think of me if I ask it? And today? Today I'm a lot more confident and I'm like, okay, you know, if I don't know something, probably there's others who don't know it and, you know, it's, and it actually restricts me if I don't know the answer to that question to go to the next level. So, you know, may, you know, I've become a lot more confident and I think it comes from that inner, you know, having the confidence that, okay, who cares if people think I'm dumb, right? I'm, if I don't understand something, I don't, and I need to know that to be able to move forward. Do you find uh, that women in, you know, you, you probably come across a lot of women in your environment, uh, and one of the things that some of them mention is they're not confident, they are a little hesitant. Have you ever coached or mentored anybody in that space, and what advice do you usually give them? Yeah, I do mentor a lot of women. Um, and I think even from my own experiences, you know, sometimes it is really about having the confidence in yourself, right? And being comfortable knowing that you can do things. And there's, you know, things don't necessarily have to be ultimatums. Um, like I have a number of people that have come to me saying that, you know, we think we need to progress to the next level in our career, but we haven't made it. And, you know, my advice with them is just go have a conversation with your manager. You know, it's not an ultimatum. You just need to let them know that you have this desire. Or but how do this... you start that conversation? Because you may have managers that may not be easy to approach, or you may have managers that are easy but may not carry a lot of weight. So how do you, how do you work that process? Do you have any tips? I think it's just getting comfortable to do that. So, you know, telling yourself, it's like you and I having a conversation here, right? It's, if you, you need to build that kind of relationship with people. It doesn't happen day one. You know, you have to get to know each other. You have to work together. My husband has actually been very, very um, helpful to me in getting more comfortable about this and learning oh. how to, um, you know, because I used to before always think that, okay, you know, my boss is my boss and there needs to be a degree of separation or I, you know, I need to like, you know, kind of stay away. But he's coached me that, you know, it, it's business relationships, right? And even in business relationships, like personal relationships, you need that level of trust and confidence. And it's not just a manager employee relationship. It's also a, we're working together for this company to get to the right successful outcomes. Do you have any habits that have helped you? Um, habits that have helped me, uh, maybe some unconscious ones, I guess. Like what? Um, I think one is just communication and, um, you know, working with people, talking to people. To me, relationships are a big part of everything you do. Um, sometimes we get lost in the, the actual outcomes, but the relationship part is very, very important. So that's one big piece of, um, I think, 
something that I'm able to communicate and maintain and build relationships. I, rather, I give a lot of importance to that. Um, the second is also just being clear to yourself what you want or where you want to go. And one of the things I say is that if you don't know where you're going, you'll never get there. So, you know, having that vision, having that clarity, even though, you know, you might take different paths to get there, but being able to have that clarity for yourself on uh, what it is you're trying to do or what you want to do um, and having that focus is um, maybe a couple of things I can think of. Wow, that is key, actually, having the focus. Well, I'm going to ask you these Prowse questions. Uh, it, this was um, something that I think will delight you. What talent would you like to have? What talent would I like to have? I'd like to have the ability to crack more jokes <laughs> and make people laugh. And this is, again, something my husband is really good at, and I wish I had some of that. <laughs> what do you consider your greatest achievement? That's a tough one. <laughs> um, I guess, what do I consider, maybe I'm going to rephrase that a little bit, what do I consider most valuable um, is really my family. Family matters. OK. And w who is your hero in fiction? In fiction, who is my hero? Hmm. Again, tough one. I can't think of one person right away. I would say I used to love P.G. Woodhouse and Bertram Wooster. Again, going back to the jokes and being able to do that. I love Steve Jobs and his, uh, he's of course not fictional, but you know, I think he's Real hero. just an amazing person. Did you get to meet him? I did, yes. I did meet him once, brief encounter, so I wouldn't say anyone would remember that other than me, but yes. Where did you meet him, at Apple? Uh, this was when he was at Pixar. Oh, when you were at Pixar. Oh, yeah. your sister worked at Pixar. Yes, yes. So it so, was at a holiday party there. So you got to meet him. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Shivani, it was wonderful to talk to you. We wish you the very best. Thank you. Thank you so much. And if you missed any of our shows, you can catch them on our YouTube channel. Join us next week for another new conversation. And thank you for tuning in. Until next time. Support for the series on women in science and tech comes from Genentech, dedicated to breakthrough science and social good that supports local communities. Because making medicine is just one way to make a difference. Genentech, the future of science is here. Online at gene.com slash future.